this mic, they think that'll work. Have no clue why, but um, we'll make them happy. Uh, let's see. So for the presentation, I was uh, the presentation I was gonna give. It works so well. Uh, <laughs> But then again, he did say if you grab it at the bottom. Okay, maybe it's I'll, I. Maybe if I uh, leave it up at the top. So I'll, I'll try to leave it at the top. Anyway, okay. So here's the deal. Um, yesterday I gave the presentation. I'm assuming most of you were here yesterday. Could be wrong. So now the presentation I was going to give today, when I actually looked at it to make sure it was in the right format, it looks like it's probably about 20% the same as the presentation yesterday. Now it's a good presentation, but at the same time, I could give you other options because I frankly don't care. So we can play presentation roulette where I can give four presentations simultaneously and keep changing slides every fourth slide. But Or I could do this. I could ask you if you want me to give other presentations and we could vote on which ones you want. So I have the learning from failure. Uh, what's another good one? Security awareness, um, th um, applying threat intelligence to security awareness. And I have case studies of how the Syrian Electronic Army tried to get me, quote unquote. Um, so I have that, there are a bunch of morons. Um, that's a separate issue, but they are a bunch of morons. Um, I have, let's see, generic security awareness, I have secrets of super spies, I have um, Zen and the Art of Information Security, uh, what's another one? Super spies. Super spy? Okay, secrets of super spies, okay, let me pull that one up. Spy short. Oh, sure. I'm trying to remember. I have spies short and spies long. Spies long. I'll go for spies long. Anyway. Okay. Um, so let me talk about this presentation and let me go over my background a little bit. Nobody covered that. But when I got out of college, I was a psychology major, so the only people that hired me was the U.S. government. So what happened was, I essentially took a job working at the National Security. Well, I took, you know, I took these tests. They said it's uh, for something called NSA. So I'm like, okay, you know, that sounds nice. So I, I basically took these aptitude tests for NSA. Apparently, I did really well. They said, okay, we'll give you a job if you get the clearance. I got the clearance. Then they're like, okay, you have really, really good computer aptitude. How about a job as a computer intern? I'm like, no, I hate computers. I want nothing to do with them. They're like, okay, fine. They're like, how about cryptanalysis where you break, you know, you break codes and all that? I go, I'm not looking at ones and zeros all day. They're like, okay, fine. They're like, how about this? How about that? Then it's like, I finally took a job I thought sounded really, really cool working as an intelligence analyst working in the National Sig Sig Signals Intelligence Operations Center, or NSOC for short. If you ever see NSA, like pictures of it inside where you see lots of big monitors and all that sort of stuff, that's the only room that looks cool inside NSA. Otherwise, it's like the land of Dilbert. So you, that's the only room that's really cool in NSA. And not only that, I was going to be working in a super secret compartmented part of this NSOC, and I couldn't work in that super cool room. I had to work in what amounted to a large closet down the hall, and for some reason that sounded good to me. I'm not sure why, but it sounded good at the time. So anyway, I took that job. And in about a month or so, I really hated my job. I mean, I completely despised my job. But everybody else hated their job, so within three months I was the senior analyst on the watch shift for a while. So there I was, and part of the senior, as part of being a senior analyst, I had to train new people coming into the office. So when we were on, like we were working rotating shifts, like day shifts, eve shifts, mid shifts, and so on, like six to two, two to ten, ten to six, and whatever. So this one woman came into the office, and her last name was Kirk, K-I-R-K, -K, like Captain Kirk. And I'm training her how to use the system. I'm like, okay, log on. Okay, great. Now you have to log on to the database. Your database ID is going to be your last name, Kirk, K-I-R-K. -K. Now enter your password, Captain, C-A-P-T-A-I-N. And she turns and looks at me in horror, going, how do you know what my password is? I'm like, you got to be kidding. And then she's like, no, Captain's really my password. I'm like, okay. And then she's like, oh, and by the way, my father was in the Army. At one point, he was a captain, so there really was a Captain Kirk. I'm like, whatever. So now remember, this is in the super secret National Security Agency, world's leader in information security. So then moving on, 
How many people, and this is dating me slightly, how many people ever heard of Xenix? Okay, so a couple people are nodding your head, and these people will sadly attest to the fact that Xenix is Unix from Microsoft. So, yeah, just imagine that one. So what NSA did, what NSA bought like 30,000 PCs, and to make them completely useless, they put Xenix as the native operating system on these PCs. So there we were using these Xenix PCs as like regular desk systems, and you know, and my bosses were a bunch of bastards, one of the reasons why I hated my, you know, I hated my job. And so they made us use this thing, like use this computer, because we were tracking certain types of military units. I can't tell you what type of units or how or whatever. And we were supposed to, like, every time, like, we had a logbook. And when we had these units, we had a page for each unit, then we have the day and time we saw the unit and the location. What happened though was our bosses were like, well, we gotta make the watch use these computers. And it's like, well, they already, it's like, well, no, they gotta do something. So they said, okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna log the computers, uh, log these units on the computer. So somebody had to sit there and create files with the name of the unit on it. And how many people heard of VI? I'm hoping everybody in this room. So if you know anything about Xenix operating system, the only editor you had was the VI editor. So here we were, regular analysts, trying to like VI into these files. So anyway, we hated the system, we hated them. It was just an all around hate fest. Now, I'm pretty sure they hated us too, but good for them. Um, but the next thing that happened though was, there I was one day, and like when you're on this shift work, some, there's either a lot to do and there's nothing to do. So one day it was 3 o'clock in the morning with nothing to do, and I was really bored, and my roommate at the time worked for NSA's Unix support branch, and he was like, well, you know, if you're using this VI, you can use like NROF or TROF, you can make numbered lists, so I decided let's play one day. So one night, 3 o'clock in the morning, nothing to do, I decided to create a file called 25 Reasons Why I Hate My Boss, and I tried to make it a numbered list. So as I was entering all this data, somewhere around reason number 17, all of a sudden the computer gets really squiggly and then comes back and everything's in Greek. I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. So then I'm like, A, alpha, B, beta, C, gamma, D, delta, whatever it was. And then that got boring after about 17 seconds or so. And so I decided let's exit the file. So I exited the file and then the command line came up in Greek. I'm like, that's not good. And then I had to like literally type in the name of like this, like VI space file name. That came completely up in Greek. I am like, I am so screwed and I was afraid to, I was gonna lose this job I completely despised for some reason. So then what happened, I had a moment of sanity, I called up my roommate, cause again, NSA's Unix support branch, he cursed me out because it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, Kevin, I'll buy you a pizza. Just tell me what to do. He's like, what's the problem? I go, everything's in Greek. He's like, is that it? I go, yeah, that's it. He's like, what are you bothering me for about that? I'm like, for some reason, this isn't intuitive. He's like, all you got to do is find a box of Xenix system disk, take out the first disk, put it in the computer, reboot the computer, you know, type in FSCK and answer yes to everything. I'm like, that's all Greek to me. Bad joke, but anyway. So there it is. So then I'm like, slow down. So I like, listen. So it's like, you know, put it in. Tight, you know, control alt delete, FSCK, yes to everything. And basically what it did was it rebooted the system, fixed, you know, FSCK file system check, fixed everything. Everything came back in English. I was relieved to keep this job I despised. On the other hand, then I was like sitting there looking, making sure I'm like, wait a second, I could look at all the files on the system. And it's like because I'm sure you know many of you probably know that if you have the system disk, you reboot it with the system disk, you reboot it in the super user mode. So then I had a new hobby at three o'clock in the morning when there was nothing to do, so I could look at everybody's files on everybody's computers, and I learned what true bastard my bosses were. So with that in mind, remember again, super secret NSA, where they essentially put the ability to break into every computer they just bought right on top, because with every computer, they gave you the system disk in a box that was right on top, so you could break into every computer without giving them a second thought. So anyway, that again, world's leader in information security. Then there was another time I finally decided I couldn't hate my job any more than I, oh, I couldn't hate computers any more than I hate my job, so I applied for the computer intern program, got in, and then I did a bunch of things like crypto, ironically, my first job, what did I tell my, I didn't want to do computers, I didn't want to do cryptanalysis, I was programming supercomputers doing cryptanalysis. It was that bad. But anyway, then I started working on this thing, and all of a sudden I'm, 
sitting there. And like one time I was like, do, oh, let me give the right job. I was working as a system developer and we were developing systems for analysts, kind of like I used to be. And as a developer, we had to add a printer to the network. Now this was a Unix network and I'm sure most of you know that to add a printer to the network, you have to be the admin on the system in order to add a printer to the system and therefore the network. So anyway, we tried to guess the admin password, couldn't guess it. Then we finally broke down, called up the administrators, and they had an administration staff. I'm like, we need a printer added to the network. They're like, okay, it'll be three days. I'm like, well, we kind of need it now. We just, they're like, is this a national security emergency? I go, nothing you ever do is a national security emergency. Why are you asking? Then they got mad and hung up on me, and then we realized they're not going to be there at all. So then we decided to do at the time what we just considered an admin trick. You know, for us, it was like, so everybody knows, so to become the super user, again, I'm assuming with this crowd you're a little familiar with Unix, you type in SU for set user and the username, and you try to become that user. Now, if you type in SU with nothing, it means set user to user number zero, which is the super user, whatever. And so when we typed in SU, you know, SU, it came up asked for the password. But then we're like, OK, let's try the admin trick. So we typed in SU space BIN, because the bin user was always on these NS say accounts. We never know why it's there. It's always there. It has super user privileges and never has a password. So we typed in SU space BIN, came back with bin with a prompt sign. So we're logged on as the bin user. Then we typed in SU and bin already has super user privileges. So all of a sudden came back with a pound sign. And there we were logged in as the administrators. We added the printer to the network. Nobody ever called up to find out why we never complained that the admins never showed up and the world was good again. But again, this was in the super secret national security agency, world's leading and information security. So when people also ask me why I'm hacking, I'm like, this isn't hacking, this is just bad ad administration. But in the meantime, you know, I'm sitting here, when you see a presentation that says secrets of super spies, after I start going through all those stories, you should kind of guess I'm being sarcastic. So anyway, um, let's see. So let's talk about spies. So let's talk about the second worst spy in the world. Not real, but there are some bad ones. But anyway, James Bond. James Bond really sucks as a spy. It's hard to find somebody as bad as James Bond, in all honesty. The only person I've been able to find that's worse than him is Sydney Bristow from Alias. How many people remember her? God, I mean, she was horrible as a spy. I mean, Maxwell Smart looks like a genius compared to her. So anyway, you got that. But you know, people are like, why do you say they're so bad? It's like, you know, they go around the world, they kill people, they blow things up. You know, they're enemies, they're, they fear them and all that stuff. And I'm kind of like, yeah, exactly. They go around the world, they kill people, they blow things up, their enemies fear them. You know, you're look, I remember one James Bond movie, I'm like, where James Bond's being chased down the canals of Venice in speedboats and they're winding their way through the canals and they're running over those gondolas and the gondoliers are shaking their fists, cursing at him in Italian and everything. And in the real world, that's kind of called an international incident. You know, that's a bad thing. And then the worst thing is they always get caught. 90 minutes into every movie, James Bond is in one version or another, spread eagle on a table with a laser going to cut him in half, crotch first. It's always got to be crotch first. But, you know, somehow he always gets caught in every movie. You know, I'm friends with, like, CIA operatives, former president and everything, and they're like, you know, we can... You know, we're not supposed to do stuff, but the biggest thing we're not supposed to do is get caught. When you get caught, that's when spy operations go bad. That's when you lose billions of dollars and everything like that. That's the bad part of, that's the worst thing about being a spy. And James Bond always gets caught. Sydney Bristow can't make dinner in her home without having to kill her roommate, if you remember that show. And I'm not making that up. That was actually one of these episodes. So anyway, and then on top of that, how can you miss this? I mean, if, you know, she walks down like she goes to bars and it's like part ways I'm here with her flaming red fluorescent red hair. That's not exactly a person who wants to be undercover. I don't know if anybody's ever, like, so there was a guy, Will William Colby who was a former director of the CIA and people described him as the quintessential spy because he couldn't get a waitress's attention in an empty restaurant. You know, that's it. And then I would talk to my, you know, 
So one of my friends, I might have, I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday, but one of my friends is Jane. Jane was in, Play, in Playboy magazine as the spy who took her clothes off. And I would ask her, what did you do? Like when you, and she's like, well, I, you know, it's like I go to places where I can potentially meet people with information and I try, I try to act like I didn't want to be noticed. And then when guys would come up to me, if they had information, I'd lead them on. Otherwise I'd blow them off. And that's how she basically decided who she might be able to get information from or whatever. But again, the key thing is they're trying not to stand out because all of a sudden, if you're the one person in the room, everybody's trying to seek attention of. That's not necessarily a good thing. So in general, what do real spies do? Because they're kind of successful at what they do. And fundamentally, there's a whole intelligence process where to be a spy, and frankly, it's a lot, this goes to anything for the most part. If you want to get, you know, if you want to accomplish some sort of mission, it goes to anything. You know, basically what spies do is they, first off, and the most important part is determining requirements. They don't just go out and spy on things. Something happens where somebody says, we need access to this information, or we need to know about this. So, for example, let's say somebody wants to know which, which desert hole in the middle of Yemen is actually a terrorist training camp or whatever, or just like a field of people who have nothing to live on or whatever. And so then they have to go ahead and it's like, so then like the intelligence community tasks the intelligence agencies, like they'll say, NSA, is there any signals intelligence that are coming out of Yemen that might indicate this? They'll go to places like NPIC, which I guess is now National Geo Geospatial Agency, and they'll take satellite pictures and try to see if there's anything in the middle of nowhere that looks like a potential camp. The CIA might use human intelligence operatives to go out and pick up people and see like if they have access to where people are going for training and stuff. And so what happens is they go out, they collect it, but more important, usually the problem is you have to analyze the data. I mean, obviously, signals intelligence in the middle of a desert, if you get any signal, that's kind of a clue. But for the most part, if you're, um, you know, like if you're sitting in downtown Berlin or something like that and trying to figure out like which cell phone's a terrorist cell phone among the millions in Berlin, that's where the problem is. But generally, even if you think about NPIC, where they take pictures after pictures of a desert, somebody has to go through all those pictures and analyze the pictures to see what potentially there might be. Because everybody makes a big deal about collection, like spy movies are about collection. And that makes them exciting in theory. The reality is the hardest part of the whole process is the analysis. It's like, you know, basically collection gets you the haystack. The analysis is finding the needle in the haystack, and that's what's most important. Then after they start finding something, then they have to go back and say, have the requirements been satisfied? So they might say, for example, well, is this plot of land a terrorist training camp? It's like, well, we think it might be, but we're not exactly sure. It's like, what do we need to find out? Well, we need more information. So they go ahead and they start going in and they say, okay, now we want all signals intelligence assets to collect on that area. We need more photographs. We need more people, human intelligence focusing on people going to that specific area and doing more information. But again, that's the critical thing. Now, more critical, and what I'm implying is science versus art. Um, now, here's the problem with most hackers. Most hackers like to portray themselves as artists. Now, there was a, so I, when I would go to DEF CON and Black Hat conferences early on, like, you know, DEF CON where it was like, you know, not a lot of, like, people who can fit in this room almost. There was like places where, so I would go to my friends and I'm trying to figure out how to get better skills. I'm like, is there anybody good I don't know? They're like, and then one time they point me, that guy there sounds like he might know what he's doing, but I'm not really sure. So I go over to him and I go, okay, my friend says you might be good. I just want to find out how you kind of hack. And the guy seeing goes, hmm, you seem humble enough, my little Padawan. I'm like, I'm going to kill you. But there he was. So there he's like telling me this. And I'm like, OK, so how do you hack computers? He's like, well, I look at a computer, I get a feel for it. I'm like, you look at a computer and get a feel for it? He's like, yeah, I can kind of sense these things. I go, let me paraphrase. He's like, you may. I go, so basically what you do is you perform an initial scan of the system based on the initial scan of the system. You know the likely hardware and likely software of the system. And the likely hardware and likely software of the system tells you the vulnerabilities that are probably inherent there. He's like, oh, no, no, it's much more than that. I go, really? So once you know the likely vulnerabilities there, you start running either, you know, like, 
You start running tools against it, or you start running manual exploits against it, you get a foothold on the system. He's like, no, it's more than that. I go, okay, so once you have your foothold on the system, then you go ahead, you look around the system, you start planting back doors, you plant passwords. He's like, you just don't understand, and he goes storming away. Why? He's not special anymore. He liked to think he had a computer and could get a feel. Now, the thing is, if you approach hacking like you get a feel for something, he wanted to be an artist. People have the impression of an artist like they look at something and they kind of, oh, maybe today it'll be this, maybe tomorrow it'll be that. If you want to be a hacker, you have to have a repeatable process. And the problem is that most hackers have a repeatable process and they don't even realize what they do. And the thing is, if they are overconfident in their process, they're going to miss things or they're going to screw things up. Because if you have a repeatable process, your repeatable process should account for all potential vulnerabilities on the system. It should account for how not to get caught, like my presentation focused on yesterday. It should, you know, or avoiding detection, I guess, is a better way to phrase it. It should focus on avoiding detection. It should focus on not causing damage and so on. There's got to be a repeatable process in what you do, especially if you're a pen tester. You know, being a pen tester, you're not, your goal isn't to play, you know, ha ha, gotcha. I mean, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. Your goal is to figure out how to fix things. And if you don't remember how you got to from point A to point B with a systematic process, you don't know how you're going to fix it. I'm not saying there's no you know, room for versatility and stuff like that. But the problem is, if you have a really well-established process that you practice time and time and time again, you're going to account for all this outside-of-the-box thinking in your so-called process. And that's critical. But the reality is, this guy was trying to portray himself like an artist, and what I did was, I defined a repeatable process that anybody could have done, not just him. Now, um, let's see. So there's this whole concept. Let me go back to my psychology day. How many people know what visualization is, like the psychological principle of visualization? Visualization is the ability to sequentially manipulate objects in your mind. So the iconic thing for that, there's the VZ2 test. Some people called it the paper folding test. And what you do with this paper folding test is you like imagine four squares, one on top of the other, and then two squares on the side. You fold that all together. You know, Hopefully you know you get a cube. You don't know you get a cube, maybe you shouldn't be here. No offense. But so that is, and then it gets sequentially harder as you go through this test. That is the VZ2 test. What has been determined, there is a correlation, not causation, there's a correlation that people with better visualization tend to have better computer aptitude. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because when you write a program, you're visualizing in your head step by step what that program is going to do. You're visualizing like how your system impacts the network and so on. So there's been a good correlation. So when NSA said, I had good computer aptitude on that five-hour test I took, Odds are pretty good. There was a test for visualization somewhere in there that was kind of embedded. I just, you know, I remember some of them, but not all of them. So anyway, that's the key thing. So there are people with good aptitude that can be successful. Why are they successful? Because most computer systems are so pathetic a moron could get into them. Let's face it, you know that's true. And morons could get into most systems. The reality, though, is you need somebody who has a systematic process who's not just going to get into the systems any moron could get into. You need somebody with a repeatable process that could get into the more advanced systems. They work their way through, chipping away. You know, If they don't get in one way, they'll get in another way. They'll look for different sets of vulnerabilities. But the key thing is that even if you have people with good ability, they also need to have a good process. And frankly, when you look at the NSA intern programs. I think I mentioned yesterday that, for example, the CIA, their career training program is a three-year program of progressive skills. You know, going in to be a Navy SEAL, that's two years of training where you first go through physical training, then you go through different skill sets like warfare and, you know, different type of whatever you have to do. Those are training programs to give people who have ability. You don't, for example, get into BUDS without some basic ability. You have to know how to swim well. You have to have good endurance. Then they weed you out during the six weeks, well, whatever, how, I forgot how many weeks that is for BUDS. But they weed you out really quickly if you don't have the physical stamina and the mental stamina to make it through the rest of the training. So that's critical. So they have to figure out if you have the ability. Then they provide the training. Then once they provide the training, you have to repeat it. I don't know how many people 
people ever research the concept of mastery, but the concept of mastery is somewhere along the lines you need 10,000 hours to get this ability to perfect it. There's a concept um, like, you know, like, so I have a black belt in karate, I'm a master scuba diver trainer and all that sort of stuff. I'm not saying that to like brag or anything, I'm saying that because it's a lot of crap. These are lots of titles, for example. The difference, a black belt knows the same things as a white belt generally does because there's only so many ways to punch, so many ways to kick, and so many ways to block. But a black belt has essentially practiced these ways to perfect it. So, you know, you could hit somebody this tall equally that somebody's that tall. Well, it's, uh, let's face it, it's a lot easier to go after somebody that tall. But, it's, you know, you got to focus. Same thing with master scuba diver trainer. Or, sorry, dive master trainer. When, with dive master trainer, you know, basically 90% of the training was how do you perfect the 20 basic skills of scuba diving, like put your equipment together, take your mask on and off. Master plumber, no offense to any master plumbers out there, but the, how much mastery in plumbing is there? It's just they've been through different circumstances, they've got the open to a lot of different things, and they just have a better skill set of applying pipes and everything else and know what works and doesn't because they've perfected it, they practiced it. And that's the difference between a scientist versus an artist, and you definitely want scientists. Also, spies know how to protect themselves from other spies. I'm talking, um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything relevant. Um, here's the difference. Basically, spies focus on information. I'll just focus on that thing. Because at the end of the day, breaking into a system is nothing. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of things uh, because, you know, generally, breaking into systems are easy. It's getting the data you need, because, well, I could say it in this environment, because when I do penetration tests, or I call them espionage simulations, I basically describe what we do is we grab a company by their balls and squeeze. Because what we do is we go out there, because we had one, one time a customer came to me, it's like I hired four different companies to do pen tests. They all came back, you know, two weeks later and said, we have full control of your entire network. We went to the CEO, the CEO says, who cares? They call me in and they're like, I told them that. Then three days later, I'm like, okay, here's your mergers and acquisitions data. Here's your executive salary compensation schedule. Here's your new technologies coming out in three years. Here's this, here's that. Oh, by the way, we have full control of your entire network. They bumped up the security budget by $10 million the next week because they had clear value. So spies focus on compromising value. That's the goal. Um, let's see. So ah, that's enough for that. Anyway. So, okay, here's one of the more important things. I kind of touched upon this yesterday, but, you know, like I said, if you're working, like I said yesterday, if you're working as a security professional, you're a failure. What you are are risk managers. And the way you manage risk is by taking into account the different components of risk. First off, there's value. Value is how much is your information or services worth as a whole. And that's how much you basically have to lose. That's your maximum risk. Once you get rid of that. Now I have that outside of countermeasures because honestly, you don't want to counter value. If you counter value, you get fired because it means you're giving up the whole company. That's the only way to get really rid of all your risk. You know, because I sometimes ask people, what's the perfect security measure? And somebody went, you know, I'm not going to ask here because I'm, I'm running behind, I think. But generally, somebody will always raise their hand and says, unplug the computer. I'm like, congratulations, that's a denial of service attack. The thing is, you always have to put data at risk to make it useful. Otherwise, if the data is not useful, it's completely worthless to begin with. So you have to put the data, make it vulnerable in one way or another. Then you have threat and vulnerability that are what add to your risk. The threat is the who or what that's out to get you. The threat can be good people people, for example, you know, like malicious, ins not, no, well-meaning insiders are the biggest threat that you might have theoretically. Then you obviously have the malicious insiders and so on. Um, then you have outsiders like hackers, cyber criminals, foreign intelligence agencies and so on. Now, then you have the what type of threats, which frankly cause more damage than people could ever admit, but people ignore those types of threats because those are what's known as malignant threats. Because you have malicious threats and you have malignant threats. Malignant threats are threats that are just there. For example, hurricanes are a great example of malignant threats that we ignore on a daily basis. Everybody can sit there talking about the availability and importance of having, you know, backups and protecting yourself from hackers, but I promise you, for example, um, Hurricane Katrina caused more damage than Osama bin Laden could have done in his wildest dreams. Likewise, Hurricane Maria did more damage than Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, 
ISIS and everybody else combined could never do. Because people ignore those. But it's like it's a hurricane. It happens all the time. You've got to worry about the malignant threats more than the malicious threats because those are more real. But then you have vulnerability. Vulnerability because threat without vulnerability means it's irrelevant. Vulnerability are the weaknesses that allow the threat to exploit you. So for example, remember I gave at the beginning the example of Captain Kirk where, so I, can't, I, keep, I keep having to bite my tongue, I don't want to mention her real name. I think she might be dead, so it might be okay soon, but either way. But the, you know, so if you had her name, like so who can guess the account of Captain on Kirk? Pretty much anybody, right? Um, you know, who could go ahead and say, well, so now could, for example, could Al-Qaeda compromise her password? Possibly. Could a teenage hacker, could a Russian spy compromise her password? Yeah. But if you get rid of that vulnerability, that means there's no threat out there that can exploit it. So if you get rid of the vulnerabilities that the threat can exploit, you, have, you reduce your risk. So basically, countermeasures are what mitigates vulnerabilities. You can attempt to mitigate threat, but in all honesty, the average group of people is not going to hunt down Al-Qaeda, ISIS, all these malicious people. You're not going to stop well-meaning insiders from doing good things. You just want to take away their ability to be stupid, for lack of a better way of describing it, and stopping them from doing you know, well-intentioned things that just cause damage. You can go ahead. You're not going to stop hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, natural disasters. Those are always going to exist. So security programs should probably focus on implementing countermeasures measures are going to mitigate the vulnerabilities causing you the maximum damage. That's what a good security program should be. Now, um, I beat that to death, so let's go to the next thing. Okay, so what's important to you? Too many people focus on the threats. The spies are focusing on the information. They don't care how they get it. They don't care if they get it from an insider. They don't care if they get it. Let me, sorry. I, I, if you can tell, having worked at NSA, God, I think Snowden is the scum of the earth. But him, as an example, aside, does Russia care how they got you know, NSA data, whether they got it from Snowden, whether they got it from the Kaspersky software incident that happened with the guy out of Shadow Brokers, whether they get it from tapping and bugging embassies or at the US around the world or whatever? No, all they care is that they get the data. That's what all spies do. They just want the data. They don't care how they get it. So let's talk about value for a, uh, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, um, go after the easy target. No, that's a, I think I used this presentation for something. Okay, let's talk about how to steal nuclear reactor designs. This was a case where a mega company hired me, and uh, so I brought a team of people in to potentially, you know, again, steal, rob them blind. Um, they wanted a no holds barred attack, full scale espionage simulation, which include, mis I pretty much could do whatever I wanted as long as I didn't theoretically commit any crimes. You know, I wasn't allowed to cause damage or anything, um, lie about who I was walking through, use internal hacking, and so on. Um, the background, this is a mega company, like Fortune 10 type of company with a global headquarters, global business unit. Um, once you have the global business unit, they have different operating units under there, like um, financial, manufacturing, energy, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. So they do a lot of different things. Um, but the thing was, at this company, they had one security officer at the corporate headquarter business unit, and he had an intern, and then he coordinated like a bunch of matrix people in, and he's like, I need help, and they're like, you got an intern, what more do you need? So he wanted to prove that somebody off the street can rob them blind, so that was the background of this thing. So here's how you steal nuclear reactor designs really quickly. So this was a company that had a nice um, campus-like setting. That's what they put in all their recruitment literature and everything like that. So I drove up to the, before I got there, the night before, I went to a local restaurant, you know, and they had one of those drop your business cards in, win a free lunch type of thing. When the, wait, when the hostess went away, I went through the business card thing, pulled somebody who worked at the company out. So then I went up to the next day, and, the, and I get to the, like the guard station as you're driving in. The guard says, can I see your badge? I'm like, I can't, I can't find my badge. Can I show you my badge? business card, I'll get a badge. He's like, sure. So I showed him the business card, let me on the corporate campus. This was during the morning rush hour. And then, so I went into park in the garage underneath the corporate headquarters. So they have one of those gates that goes up and down. So somebody swiped their badge, but I just followed somebody through before the gate went down. So then I was in the garage with everybody else. Then this was the morning rush hour. You had to take a staircase up. So I took the staircase up, and I was starting to, you know, and but everybody was holding the door open for everybody else, so I didn't need my access card or have an access card. So I went up there, and then I set, found an empty office, pretty much said, OK, so I called the operator. I'm like, hi, I was just assigned to this office. How do I reset the voicemail and everything like that? The, and so the operator reset the voicemail. 
So then I had an accomplice with me. So me and my accomplice, I wanted to get badges for us. So we walked in, and this they actually kept visitors well confined to the open, well, the um, entranceway. And so what happened was, me and my accomplice, we came in from the inside of the company, not the entranceway. So we're like, I just went up to the receptionist. I go, how do we get badges? She's like, oh, just go to the office on the right. So I go to the office on the right. I'm like, hi, me and my friend need badges. He's like, oh, OK, fill out these forms. So I filled out my form. He filled out his. We needed authorization signatures. So I signed his form. He signed my form. We went and we got our pictures taken. And now we had actual corporate badges. So then we get on a plane fly across the country to the desert because they like to do nu nuclear stuff in the desert. So flew across the country and then we're like sitting there and the auditors are there, we're having dinner. The auditors are like, do you want to go to the facility today because tonight there's really nothing to do in this town. We're like, sure. So the auditors, they're in their car, I'm in mine. The auditors are driving up, they get to the facility gate. We see them talking to the guard. We see the guards like, like wave them to a, a building on the left like the visitor center. And then I drive up, I show my badge, and the guard goes, do you know where you're going? I go, I think it's building 38. He's like, okay, go straight down the road about a quarter mile, make your first left turn, your second right, and the building's on the right. I go, okay, thanks. I'm like, why are those guys going over that building? He's like, oh, those guys, those guys are auditors. We make sure we, they log in and we know where they're going, because that's what they want us to do. I'm like, good job. So anyway, then I drive to the building, and we wait like 10, 15 minutes for them to sign, and then they finally get there. We walk around. You know, the building was pretty empty because they had a bunch of layoffs recently. So we find a room we'll set up, and pretty much that was it for the night. Then the next day, I told the orders, I'm like, leave your car here. You're all coming in my car because I'm not waiting for you two idiots to sign in again. So we got in my car, and I'm like, have my badge up as I'm driving to the front gate. This was during the morning rush, and the guards just like, this because he didn't want to bother slowing down the morning rush hour and it really pissed me off because I didn't need the badge. I worked so hard to get the badge. I thought I was so brilliant. I didn't need the badge. So there we were driving straight through and then I like get there and I'm sitting down at my desk or we sit down at the desk and the auditors are like okay and then I pick up the phone. I'm like hi can you tell me where the graphics department is and the auditors are like what do you mean graphics department? Are we going to engineering? I'm like nah maybe later. Oh, by the way, the engineers were worse. I could tell you that story. That was even uh, that was a better one. But um, anyway, the engineer is. I'm like, here's the thing. The engineers might know what they're protecting, but the graphics department. One day they're working on five-year plans. The next day they're working on financials. The next day they're working on nuclear reactor proposals, and they don't have no clue what's in there. They don't care. It's just what they do. They're like, whatever. So anyway, I, the operator says, OK, I'll connect you. I go, I don't want to be connected. I just want to know where they're located. So she gives me a building and room number. So I'm like, OK, I'll be back in a while. So then I basically walk 10, 15 minutes across the desert parking lot, get to their building, get in the building. And there might have been a lock on. It doesn't matter. I just tailgated somebody in if there was. Then I walk in the office I was told was the graphics department. I go, who does the nuclear reactor designs? They're like, um, try on the other side of the room. I go, who does the nuclear reactor designs? They go, try down the hall. I go, who does the nuclear reactor designs? They go, try across the hall. I go, who does the nuclear reactor designs? Anybody remember the movie Star Trek IV? It was the one with the whales and, you know, check off in San Francisco during the height of the Cold War. Going, where are the nuclear vessels? Where are the nuclear vessels? With police and everybody's like, why is that Russian guy asking for nuclear vessels? And, and I, I felt like Chekhov. I'm like, what do I have to do to be caught around here? So there I was wandering the halls and all of a sudden, and so then finally they say try downstairs. I go downstairs. I look in this room. They have got glass on the you know glass wall, and there's like a bunch of people working on these Unix workstations. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. So I walk in. I go, do you do the nuclear reactor designs? They go, yes, we do. I go, you people are really hard to find. They're like, yeah. Do we smell or something that? They, I go, no. You seem like lovely people. They're like, well, good. And I'm like, okay. So now you do these things. Do you do these proposals? When you do the proposals, are they stored on your system or are they on a server? They go, they're on a server. I go, do you know where that server is? They go, no. I go, can I sit down on your computer for a quick second? They go, sure. So then I open up a command window. <laughs> 
just type in, open up a command window, and I just type in more, M-O-R-E slash E-T-C slash host, at host. And that, for those of you that aren't aware, prints up a list of all computers that computer connects to on a regular basis. One was almost literally named proposal server with the IP address, so I basically went ahead, wrote down that IP address, wrote down that, wrote down a couple other things. I go, thanks, I think that's all I need. They go, stop, oh, sure, thanks, stop by anytime. I go, I sure will. So anyway, get the phone, I walk out, I get on my cell phone, I call my accomplice, I'm like, here's the IP, here's the system name, and then I walk 10, 15 minutes back across the desert parking lot, he looks up, he goes, okay, got it. I'm like, oh, that was kind of quick. And then he goes, oh, by the way, should somebody be logged on from India on these systems? So I go, probably not. So then we had to call up the admin, no, no, I'm sorry, call up the um, security manager, and this was the guy back across the country, and then he's like, I started describing what we did, I'm like, Okay, he's like, how could you have done all that in four hours? I go, we've only been here an hour, you forgot the time difference. He's like, whatever, what, you know. Then I'm like, now, he goes, okay, so I have to ask you another question. I go, should somebody on these systems be logged on from India? He's like, I don't know, maybe we have a subcontractor. I go, okay, let me be more specific. Should somebody be logged on these systems as a super user from India? Then he started cursing and it ruined our day because we had to turn the whole thing from a pen test to an incident response, which wasn't as much fun. So anyway, that was like the first couple hours at this site. Now, um, again, if I have more time, ask me about the HR people, ask me about the engineers. Those are different stories. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, 50. Okay, but anyway, results, um, nuclear reactor designs, compromise, emerging technologies. Because while I was doing that, he scanned the whole network. He saw what new like generator technologies they were having, a whole bunch of other stuff that he was able to download, national security implications. I didn't need the ID card. More important, everything happened within a day and a half. Nobody knew about the India hack because nobody was on there detecting the events. They logged these logons, but nobody was looking in the log files to actually see who was logging on to the systems and so on. Um, let's see, case study two, this is where I was breaking into a high tech type of firm, can't tell you which type of firm, but basically this was a company that was, they wanted a full scale espionage simulation, no holds barred attack. I was going to go on site by myself and do some on site hacking. I was able to have remote hackers if I could have them set up and everything like that. And um, this company had seven cases of industrial espionage in the previous three years before I did it. Two were sponsored by the Chinese government, one was sponsored by the Indian government, so they had a serious problem. But the issue was that when it would come down to it, somebody would go, like the security manager would meet with these people and he would be like, can't we make it better now? They're like, look, that was Joe who stole the information. Joe is the guy who invented the information. We're not going to keep the information from Joe. So whatever you're going to tell us to do is not going to work. And so he wanted to prove an idiot off the street can rob them blind. So he hired me. And I don't know how I felt about that to this day. So anyway, a lot of developments, billions of dollars, yada, yada, yada. Anybody have a laser pointer quickly? Never mind. OK, so here's how you steal nuclear reactor design. Uh, not, not, anyway, here's how you steal high tech stuff really quickly. So I started off doing internet searches, open source Googling, and all that sort of stuff. Oh, thank you. See, here's a woman who is prepared. Everybody give her a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, and she has a dog. Maybe I'll take that too. Um, <laughs> So, wow, I, looking at it now, maybe some people can't read it from the back, so I better talk. So, hmm. oh, okay. I'll figure out how to do that sometime. It's like one button, figure it out yourself. Anyway, so I start off with open source information, and the most valuable thing I found, because I asked the company, they, the, the, the reality or the scenario was I was being hired as a temporary employee because they said they had like a third of their company was temporary employees at any point in time. So they wanted me to basically go in as a temporary employee. I was like, okay, what could a temporary employee get? And they're like, well, here's your employment documents you get. You probably could have found these um, news company newsletters that would be sitting in the HR office and so on. So anyway, in the company newsletters, the most valuable thing I found, and just trying to cut this short, um, was essentially a letter from the CEO to the whole company. He's like, I want to thank the company for leading the, you know, leading the industry into the next decade and all that sort of stuff. And they're like, and I want to especially thank these people working on these projects. And they probably felt really good. I felt awesome 
system because what he did was he gave me a shopping list. He told me what was the most valuable and who was working on it. So I started off, so once I got in there, um, I went through, like filled out paperwork, didn't put real information down on a lot of it. And then I got a big T badge, like a badge with a T, because the security manager tried to do what he could. But I was the only idiot wearing a badge, so I took my badge off and put it in my pocket. Then I was assigned to my desk, and then I got to my desk, and I started calling people up, and I called up the leading researcher on the company's top project, and I go, hi, I was just hired as the new head of information security, and I'm supposed to protect all the company's most valuable data. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. Can you please help? She's like, yeah, we've had some problems. I go, yeah, that's why I was hired. She's like, well, I don't really know anything. It's like, I should like give you to our team leader. Our team leader is responsible for this product, and you know she would know the whole development effort. I'm like, could you introduce me? So she teleconferences the team leader in. Team leader says, well, Oh, this is another thing to ask me about, but the team leader's like, look, I'm going off site for three days, but I can give you an hour if you could get over to the building right now. If you see me, ask me why she went off site. That's another good story. But anyway, so then it was like, so I'm like, okay, so I jump in my car, drive over to her building, and then all of a sudden I needed the access card, but the security manager only gave like me as a temporary employee access to the building I needed to get into. So then I waited for somebody to go out and then went in as they went out. And then I, when I met with her, I go, hi, I um, you know, went through the same spiel, a new head of security, blah, blah, blah. She's like, well, everybody has their own data. I go, you can't make a multi-billion dollar product with everybody just having random data. She's like, well, we do have these meetings every other week, and these meeting minutes have some sensitive information and stuff like that. I'm like, could I see a copy of some of these meeting minutes? She's like, um, there's a binder on the shelf next to you. So I look up, I pull that down, and ha I go, can I make a copy of some of these? She's like, well, hold on a second. I'll call my assistant, and she'll print up a copy of all of them while we're talking. I'm like, OK, thanks. So then I had that. Then I go, well, there's got to be other places then she's like well we have these government affairs people and the government affairs people are supposed to summarize how we manufacture things because these type of products involve runoff issues so the FDA and other people have to know how we manufacture stuff like this so we have to do whatever and they have to get information about how the products manufacture I go can I speak you know can you give me the name of a government affairs person I go is there anybody else she's like well we have these business managers and business managers business managers track all the important data for all the management and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, can I have the name of the business manager on this other product project that you, because I already thought I nailed that product pretty well. And then she's like, oh, here's the guy. Um, so anyway, then I went ahead and then I ran back to my desk. I started going through the meeting minutes and there was nothing really that made sense in the meeting minutes. So I got depressed and I went to lunch. Then after lunch, I met with the person who was the government affairs representative. Uh, where is that? The government affairs rep. And this woman was a nice formal woman. I sat down there. I'm like, so what do you do? She's like, well, I'm, I create these documents that go to the government. I put in information from these different departments, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like sitting there. I go, how frequently do you back up these documents? She's like, I don't back up the documents. I go, no, but she's like, well, maybe the administrator's back. I go, these are valuable documents. How? I go, if you want to, if you put these documents on a drive, I can, you know, take the drive and lock it up in a safe and security just in case she, and she looked has a, so I like felt her, I'm like, no, you look, you don't look comfortable doing that, don't worry about that. I'm like, can we try this, potentially I could back up your documents remotely, could I just come behind your desk quickly? She's like, sure. I go, okay, now can you click over here, now click there, now click here, click there, and click here. And what I did was, uh, what I did was I walked her through the process of sharing her hard drive to the entire network. So, um, anyway, I go, well, it looks like I could potentially back up your document remotely. I'm not going to without your permission, but just here's my card. Oh, before I got there, I had fake business cards printed up that said something. Um, so anyway, I was like, you know, new, like information security man. I can't remember what it said now, but it was, it looked, they looked great. The, the security manager actually, the real security manager wanted me to print up his cards in the future. They were that good. So what happened was, so then I go ahead and I hand in this, or I get the, and I'm like, you look uncomfortable. Comfortable. So, you know, and then I ran back to my desk and I'm sitting there navigating through the network, getting to her network segment. And the security manager was behind me and he was like sitting there wondering. And then right as I was getting to her network segment, all of a sudden, a, like a dialog box popped up and said, please enter user ID and password for this network subsegment. Because what the security manager did, he knew how valuable that network segment was. And he put in an additional layer of authentication before he could get on the network. And I was really pissed at him.
So then we were there, and then I started being depressed, and I went back through the meeting minutes. And as I was going through the meeting minutes, there was a note from the government affairs person that said the draft document is available, to, is, is ready for review, and is, a, is ready to go to the government. Please log in using your own user ID and the following password and review the document. And I'm like, no way. And I'm like, way. Because all of a sudden, you're like sitting there, and it's like, wait a second. So then I logged up. I saw the distribution list of the meeting minutes. The company default lo you know, login was first initial, last name. So I just picked somebody at random, first initial, last name, with a password. And then all of a sudden, that little network, her little hard drive popped up. And there I had like not the one document to make one multi-billion dollar product. I had five different documents. Two of them were for multi-billion dollar products. Three of them were only for a hundred, few hundred million dollar products, but I could live with that. So then I was sitting there with that, and the security manager was like, okay, this wasn't good, but it got better. So then what happened, at least for me, not him. So then um, the next thing that happened was, the next morning I met with the business manager. Or was it, it was the next, well, actually it was the next day. I met with the business manager, and it was a pleasure to screw this guy over. I kept asking, he's like, you know something, I met with a security guy three months ago, and I haven't heard from him since, and I'm very happy about that. I go, really? Why? He's like, because I believe security stands in the way of innovation, and this company's built on innovation. I knew I hated that guy, and somehow his name was the only name that managed to leak into the report. I don't know how. It was a complete accident. I usually don't put names of people, but somehow this accidentally went in. So all of a sudden, I'm like listening to the guy, and it's like, well, security stands in the way of innovation. I'm like, so what do you do as a business manager? He's like, well, I read everything that comes in, and then I summarize it for executive management on the status of all developments. I'm like, okay, could I see one of them? He's like, you know what? I gave one to the security guy three months ago. Why don't you find him and get a copy from him? I'm like, you're a ray of sunshine. So there I was doing this. I'm like, what about that? Security guy three months ago. What about this? Security stands in the way of innovation. Then all of a sudden I realized, by the way, he had no lock on his door. He had a box of disks at the time on a shelf marked project management report backup so I was not concerned by this point in time. So then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, did the security guy three months ago ask you about your computer directories? He goes, no. I go, if you could just tell me where your computer directories are, you will never hear from me again. He's like, I like that. I go, I knew you would. So I'm like, where are the directories? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, let me come behind your desk. What I need you to do is I need you to log off of your computer and then log back in, and based upon where and when the icons pop up on the screen, I'll be able to tell where your directories are. I hope you all know I'm lying. So what happened was he like logged off, and then I'm watching him like enter his user ID to confirm his user ID. Then I was trying to see his password. His password was way too quick, and I couldn't pick it up. I was bothered by it. And I'm like, OK. Um, I'm like, and he's like, it didn't work. Then he tries again. He's like, yeah, I thought it was PMR12, but it's not working. I'm like, gee, I wonder what the next one's going to be. So it's like all of a sudden, so, you know, for project management report, I go, okay. Um, then he calls somebody up. He goes, what's the password? I'm like, what's the password? So anyway, then all of a sudden I'm starting like, okay, this is good. And then after a while, he couldn't guess it. I go, I'm going to guess this guy's password before he does anyway. So I run back to my desk. Anybody want to take a quick gander as to why? He doesn't know what his password is. No, he never logged off of his computer to have to log back on. And remember, there's no lock on his door, so I knew I would get that anyway. So there I was. I run back to my desk. I guess his password on the second try. His password was the same as his user ID. He didn't even know this. So anyway, log on there, and then all of a sudden, I see he wasn't the business manager for one product. He was the business manager for seven products. So I had seven products, every document ever created. Then I remembered what's the password. So I went up a directory level to the directory of all the business managers. And then I was able to download all the documents from all the business managers in the entire company. So I had every product the company had in development. And this was in the first day and a half. The security manager was standing there. He's like, I'll give you four hours to head to Mexico. After that, you're, you know, you're on your own. Because it was like a, a sad joke. Like anybody by this point who got all the information literally just stole the company. It was like, we'll give you a head start if you want to go on the rogue or whatever. Because it was like literally worth billions of dollars in four hours. So anyway, that was one thing. And that's how compromised the critical data that way. I'll go through another thing. Like there was ha like some remote hacking involved. What I had to do to get remote hacking, this company, again, the security manager did things well. He had secure ID cards where so if you remote 
logged in remotely, you had to have the secure ID card. And so what happened was I called up, I'm like, I called up the help desk, I'm like, how do I get a secure ID card so I can log in remotely? They're like, you fill out an application. I go, how do I get an application? They're like, we mail it to you. So uh, they emailed me an application, I f uh, got it, I started filling it out, and it needed the real security manager's signature on it. And they knew who the real security manager was. And so I'm looking around, he's like, don't expect me to sign that. I go, I'm not. And then I found the security policy document in some drawer that had his signature on it. I literally do one of those bad things of putting the document up to the window and tracing his signature. And he's like, this better not work. So anyway, so then I literally hand carried this over to the help desk. And I hand it, and there's this guy and this woman there. And they're sitting there. And all of a sudden, so I walk over. The woman seems friendlier. I start handing it to the woman. The guy, trying to be funny, grabs it out of her hand and goes, hmm, how do we know this is really John's signature? I couldn't make this up. But again, he was asking for all the wrong reasons. He was trying to be funny. So I'm like, good question thinking, but how do I? I'm like, just look carefully, and I shove it in his face. He's like, yep, John's signature, give him the card. So with the blessing of an idiot, I now have the secure ID card that I FedEx back to my accomplices, who then logged on the network and started doing remote hacking as well. I'll leave it there. There's a little bit more, but anyway, you get the points. So all but one effort was seriously compromised. I actually did get everything. The CEO didn't want it because it was like they were acquiring another company, and they didn't want that known. So they're like, we'll give you everything but that. Um, that was an interesting thing. Nobody reported. And here's the big thing. Everything I told you, they had much better than average security for the industry. There is a whole bunch of cascading failures from people, from process, from everything else that happened. So anyway, remember risk. Um, I have that there for some reason, not sure why now. But anyway, threats and decisions. Everybody was concerned about the threat. When I met with the CEO of that last company, the CEO is going to say, Hum, what's the likelihood somebody as good as you is going to target our company like this? And the CISO, he was sitting there. Ira, we had three attacks in the last three years from China and India. And they seem to have more money than I gave Ira for this attack. So we better make sure we do something. So anyway, that was that. Um, what's a spy security program? Again, spies don't worry about the threat to a large extent. You have to worry about the threat if you're concerned about specific motives and you know specific people are targeting you. But generally, you have to look at the underlying vulnerabilities. Because like I mentioned with that whole thing, like with Captain Kirk's situa situation, if you get rid of the password of Captain, you get rid of the opportunity for any threat to exploit you. So what you try to do is mitigate the vulnerabilities most likely to be exploited, which mitigates the opportunity for any threat, even if they're well-meaning insiders to do you harm. Um, next, remember defensive information warfare. I beat that to death yesterday, so I'm going to go on. Um, detection is the more important thing. Everything I mentioned, somebody like me was going to get in there, like it was mentioned before. Somebody was going to, like they had bad insiders who stole information before I got there, at least on the first one. And the second one, it's, they even, well, yeah, the people from India. Nobody was out there. The failure in protection is inevitable. When you have a company with million computers or whatever, you're going to have people get in. You've got to make sure there's good detection in place. So anyway, optimizing, did I, I had this slide in the presentation, okay, remember, you want to optimize risk, not minimize risk, and yada, yada, yada. So then, potential loss should drive your budget, I had that slide in yesterday. I guess it's good I had that yesterday, so I could actually end on time. So why is Sydney Bristow the worst spy in the world? Here's the thing about she, why she's the worst spy in the world. She always runs into good security programs. Like here's an iconic episode of Sydney Bristow, right? In Sydney Bristow, all of a sudden, there was one episode where they're like, okay, Sydney, we need you to steal a thumb drive. The thumb drive is, is in a safe in an underground lair, and how you're going to do it is basically there's a manhole cover. The manhole cover is alarm, but what we're going to do is we're going to cut the power to the neighborhood, which is going to deactivate the alarm to the manhole cover. It's like, got it. Then it's like, there's going to be, when you go down there, there's two guards. Here's a tranquilizer gun with two darts to shoot the two guards. It's like, okay, got it. It's like, here's the, here's the layout, the blueprints for the underground lair. And so you're going to go down this hallway, that hallway, and then you're going to run to the end of the hall, and at the end of the hall, there's a picture frame. 
thing. Open, go behind the picture frame, and here's a safe, and here's the co you know combination to the safe. It's like, okay, got it. So then the operation goes down. Cut the power to the neighbor. She drops down. She shoots the two guards. Goes ahead. Of, of course, masterfully navigates this underground lair. Runs to the end of the hallway. Moves the picture frame. Types in the code. And then as she opens up the safe, all of a sudden an alarm goes off. Why does the alarm go off? Because the bad guy practices good detection, defense, and depth. Because he knows, wait a second, I have no control over the power which goes out every time somebody hits a telephone pole. I, these guards are apathetic anyway, I can't trust them. My blueprints for my underground lair are probably on file in City Hall someplace anyway. If anybody doesn't know that, a hallway that leads to nowhere with a picture frame behind it doesn't have a safe there, they're a complete idiot anyway. You know, probably a half dozen people have this combination, so I'm going to implement an alarm nobody else knows about to catch somebody who's going to do this. Why do they do this? They want to make good movies. They want to have Sidney Bristow shoot things out and everything. My stories, frankly, are more funny than how do the I think the Wall Street Journal once said alternating, alternating hilarious and harrowing. That sounded really poetic, but nothing I described in what I did was harrowing, honestly. Really, at the end of the day, everything I did was kind of straightforward. It wouldn't make, I mean, it's funny, but it doesn't make for a good movie because there's no climactic escape scene at the end. Sidney Bristow has to have this climatic escape scene, as scene. Why is James Bond always caught at the end, like 90 minutes into every movie with his genitals at risk? Because that's how they make an exciting James Bond movie. They have to have that escape at the end of the movie. So when you think about that, what do security people want to do? I mean, seriously, at the end of the day, oh yeah, but just remember, the bad guys in these Bond villain movies and spy movies actually have good security, and that's important. But why do you want to do this? You want to make bad movies. You don't want to be the life of the party. You don't want to go walk into a, you know, a party and say, so what do you do? I do security. It's like, well, that must be exciting. What happened? Well, we had these people break in, and they took down our whole network, and the FBI came in, and we're calling all these foreign intelligence. It's like, wow, that's really great. No, that means you're really bad at security. You want to be the guy at the security part. You want to be the guy at the party. It's like, what do you do? I do security. It's like, well, what do you do? Well, it's like I go through these alarms and just see what... Wow, that sounds fascinating. Where's the beer? That's the type of person you want to be at the parties. So anyway, why do they do this? You want to make bad movies. And so what happens is the reason they're bad spies is... I probably should go around. They're bad movies. Um, they, you know, defense in depth accomplishes this. Having good detection in place, having people who actually pay attention to detection mechanisms and mechanisms in place does this. They want to have the intrigue and sex in these shows and all that sort of stuff. And I'm waiting for that myself. So anyway, I'm still waiting. And if you do security well, you don't get that, unfortunately. So anyway, here's a big, you know, I like to say like awareness train. I like to focus on this. I spoke a little bit about this yesterday. But here's the concept I didn't put up yesterday. At the end of the day, the thing is, a lot of people laugh. They're like, why do people do that? The reason why a lot of my stories are so funny is because people think, wow, that they totally have no common sense whatsoever. And the problem is, most security programs, it's like behind every stupid user is a stupider security professional. Because most security professionals assume that users, or even themselves, have common sense. You can't have common sense without common knowledge. And all the security people out there are assuming users have common knowledge. What you've got to do is you've got to give people common knowledge so they can exercise common sense. And that's really what a good awareness program should do. And again, that's not training. That's having good practices in place that people see in practice and follow, not making people watch a three-minute video once a year or something like that. So anyway, oh, sorry, that's the slide I should be on. Anyway, so awareness training, um, that's, that's what I was talking to. So in summary, the real spies are sadly better than Bond and Bristol. When you look at things like this, I mean, Really, no matter what you think of Snowden, he could have caused, Russia would have almost preferred he didn't go public, because this way people wouldn't know exactly what he stole to the extent he stole it. Same thing with you know a whole bunch of other spies out there. The whole shadow brokers thing, some of it doesn't make sense that Russia got copies of all the NSA tools and then released them to the internet, because it's more interesting for Russia to keep a hold of that and use it themselves without being there. But So those are some things that don't make sense. But most spies are really better. There's a lot of espionage that goes on around the world that most people never hear of on a regular basis. 
You don't have spy agencies like, you know, the US spy agencies have $30 billion, Chinese have 30 billion, Russia has 30 billion. There's like a trillion dollars in espionage going on around the world that most people don't have a clue about. But again, they focus on information and services. They're not focusing on how do I hack a computer. Sometimes they want to hack a computer for preparation of the battlefield, like if they want to take down the power grid at specific times. But really, at the end of the day, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you know, how do I go in and do my espionage simulations? Our focus is to grab people, grab companies by their balls and squeeze. That's what spy agencies want to do. But they don't squeeze. They just have them holding them. And they're like, we're going to use them at a point in time in our choosing. And that's what criminals do. What's the perfect crime? The perfect crime is the crime nobody ever knew was committed. And that's what a good criminal wants to do. They want to rob you blind and, not, and you don't even know that the data was stolen. And what you've got to do is, you've got to worry about those people. You're not worrying about the people who steal something, come in and come out. That's a finite theft. However, you're worried about the people you don't know about, and that's much more important. But you really can stop most of the people. Again, buy my book. My book is awesome. And any questions? Okay, have a lovely day. Thanks.